you have to click start webinar. Good evening and welcome to our sixth episode of the Game Changer Sessions, proudly brought to you by Samson Medical Technologies. I'm your host, Andrew Nutman, CEO of Samson Medical Technologies. Samson Medical Technologies is headquartered in Sydney, Australia. We provide a range of innovative, clinically proven medical, cosmetic and biological technologies to the Australian and New Zealand markets. Our main objective is to bring innovation and add value and long-term growth to our customers' practices and businesses and help them achieve better patient outcomes. We have key relationships with leading manufacturers and surgeons worldwide, which gives us access to new developments and global trends. This keeps our customers ahead of the market curve. In tonight's episode, we are hosting one of the industry's legends, Professor Bill Walsh from University of New South Wales, who will be discussing myths, legends, and reality of allografts. Professor Bill Walsh is the director of the Surgical and Orthopedic Research Laboratory at UNSW, and his research interests encompass the biology and biomechanics and connective tissue healings and strategies to improve clinical outcomes using biomaterial and biotechnologies in injured and diseased state. His goal is to provide a collaborative and exciting research environment to further understand and interface between surgery, engineering and medicine. A few housekeeping uh, rules, please. Um, the Q&A tab is down the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A tab at the bottom. Uh, Professor Bill Walsh will, um, I'll hand over at the end and we'll be able to answer those after the presentation. For any technical difficulties, please reach out to me via the function at the bottom of the screen. Um, over to you, Bill. Thanks, Andrew. Good evening, Thanks so much everyone. for taking part in tonight's session. It's my pleasure. Uh, do you want to, uh, yes. All right, I'll just share my slides. Well, good evening, everyone. And um, I hope everyone's doing well. And uh, we're coming out of lockdown very soon in New South Wales. And so, just, let me just get back to the beginning. We'll start at the beginning instead of the end. Okay, as Andrew said, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is meant to be a, a, a fun talk. And uh, I'd like to talk about um, the concepts related to bone healing, bone grafting, and allografts. And I'd like to acknowledge Samson for asking me to do this, and my friends and colleagues uh, and from Australian Biotechnologies, and my team at the Surgical and Orthopedic Research Laboratories in Sydney. As Andrew said, my name is Bill Walsh, and I'm a professor at UNSW, and I'm coming uh, to you guys tonight uh, from my lounge room or in the back room at my house. Um, there are a lot of myths out there. And uh, you know some of the myths with respect to Loch Ness, and uh, everyone must love all the different Thor movies and all of that. But there are also a lot of legends out there, and obviously Greg Inglis is a legend of South Sydney, and unfortunately South did not uh, finish off the NRL season to win the grand final, but he's set certainly a legend of the game. But there are also the legends of orthobiologics, and I think it's important for us to reflect and honor those legends. This is Professor, uh, Professor Marshall Urist, who is an orthopedic surgeon from California. And he is really the one who set off the entire orthobiologics age of medicine um, when he discovered the inductive components of bone in his uh, groundbreaking work in 1965 on auto induction in bone. And we'll pay homage to some of that work that he published many, many years ago. Well, the game plan for tonight, obviously there's a time limitation. We have uh, only about 30 to 35 minutes, and I just have to make sure I keep track of time. Uh, but we have a short period of time to chat together. Um, it would be great to have everyone in the laboratory setting or at a meeting, and we can go into further detail. But if you do want to go into further detail, please feel free to reach out to me um, via my UNSW email. And we'll talk about bone grafts, and I'll also talk about allografts and dense gas, uh, dense gas technology. 
which is also known as supercritical uh, carbon dioxide. And then I'll also share with you some um, interesting uh, understandings of inductive graphs and demineralized bone fibers, uh, fibers, but time is our enemy tonight. So when you think about a biological treatment, regardless of the surgical subspecialty that we consider, there are many different options. And as many of you uh, may know, I'm uh, traditionally interacting with orthopedic and spinal surgeons in our work. And uh, we have a lot of uh, understanding of their clinical scenarios and the clinical requirements. But you know, when you're um, opposing what biological treatment you can use uh, for your patient and for your surgical um, scenario, you can start scratching your head because there are so many different options out there. And hopefully this talk will provide you with a little bit of the basic science insight into what treatment op options you have. And if we look at wound healing and biology of bone healing in general, it's a very complex, uh, very complex pathways are involved. When you have an initial incision or any type of wound, platelets come in and play a role uh, and they can go down the TGF beta pathway where you can get healing based on a platelet driven pathway. Uh, or you can also have platelets releasing PDGF. And PDGF can also play a role in a different wound healing pathway, um, all, all involved in the overall cascade of bone healing. And in one of the papers that we published with um, one of my PhD students a couple of years back and a couple of my staff, we looked at the different factors that are involved in bone healing versus time, uh, from the early hematoma to soft callus to hard callus to bone remodeling. And we can see that there are a variety of not only cellular components that play a role, but different growth factors. And many of you will, will appreciate this, that it is a cascade. It is a dynamic, um, elegant concert of different musicians, different songs, all playing together to make a beautiful, beautiful music, which is ultimately bone healing. And this is something that has fascinated me for the past 35 years uh, as I've been in this field. And really, when you th start thinking about what's your graft, now, depending on the surgical condition and the surgical scenario, you have to consider different things. Um, clearly, the patient uh, and the surgical and the hardware factors all play an important role. What's the age of the patient, potential comorbidities, what type of surgical procedure are you performing, um, what type of hardware are you using? In the orthopedic and the spine world, often we have screws and cages and graphs and plates, so we have a variety of different hardware aspects. And then another important component for your graft material is this, how does it handle in the, uh, in the surgical site? How does it handle in the anatomical site? Does it migrate? Does it not migrate? What does it appear like on a radiograph? How can we monitor the healing versus time? So there's certainly a lot to consider and we haven't even discussed the, the basic science or the biomechanics. But really, what do you need and what do you expect? Um, but really, what do you, well, what do you want and what do you expect? But really, what do you need? And depending on the local environment, um, having the ability for a graft material, and we can use a bone graft, integrate with the local site, support new bone formation, uh, not migrate, easy to handle in the operating, uh, operating theater, and ultimately uh, take care of the, the requirements of the anatomical site for new bone formation. That would be um, what, a, what some of the ideal components that you would uh, want to come after. But what happens in vivo with, diff graph, with different graft materials? And why do some graft materials work and why do some don't? And you know, this gets us into looking at the basic biology and the biomechanics of these different scenarios. So when we think about bone grafting and orthobiologics, we, um, everyone should be well aware that we have a lot of options. Um, obviously, autograft is an early option um, that you can go to but it has some known limitations that we can consider. Then we can, tr we can transition into allograft and synthetic materials. And it's important to understand what these materials are, how they're manufactured, how they respond in vivo, and how they handle um, so that you can make the right choice for your patient and for the surgical uh, scenario. And then I'll also discuss a little bit tonight about demineralized allografts or processed allografts where you take a, um, a bone and you process it with an acid extraction so that you can create demineralized bone uh, or demineralized fibers um, and also synthetic graft materials. On the synthetic graft side, these are the calcium phosphates and the like. Um, and I've been um, studying these materials for the past 30 odd years. 
when you start thinking about how you use either allographs or um, processed allographs or synthetics, you can use them as extenders, enhancers, or substitutes. If you use it as an extender, you're adding it to autograph. If you're using it as an enhancer, you're trying to augment the properties of autograph. And if you're using it to substitute autograph, we don't want to use autograph at all. So again, that has uh, potential benefits as well. But when you start thinking about all these different materials, synthetics and the like, is that do they have any, any excipients? What are the carriers? Um, how are they delivered? What do they look like on the radiograph? And importantly, how do they resorb uh, in vivo and what's their in vivo response? Now, this alone is a separate topic that we could talk about for days. Again, we're not going to be able to get through everything. But I wanted to start with a few simple um, definitions and a few concepts. And we often refer to these, and you'll probably hear people come to your office and talk to you in theater about osteoconductive and inductive materials. But what, this, what does this really mean? It can get quite confusing. And we can talk about osteoinductive um, allographs, but we also can talk about osteoinductive synthetic materials, which form uh, bone in a different pathway than the allograph-based pathways. But that just again, is, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a demonstration of how elegant biology is and bone healing is, is that there are multiple pathways that can achieve often um, a very important outcome. So osteogenicity refers to, and I'm gonna start with osteogenicity because that's something that we often consider with autograft, is osteogenicity refers to situations when osteoblasts are present and they're able to produce new bone and a new calcium phosphate uh, is formed within a collagen matrix. And then that is um, part of the bone healing pathway. And osteogenicity is something that synthetic graft materials uh, or materials that don't have a cellular component can have at the start. These cells have to migrate into it uh, so that it can actually have an osteogenic component. Then we talk about osteoinductivity. And this is a, a nice little buzzword that was originally started, you know, based on Professor Uris's work uh, in terms of an inductive material is that when you place a material into an ectopic site, it forms bone. Now, traditionally, we consider this through a cartilaginous or an endochondral ossification pathway where non-differentiated cells um, are stimulated to differentiate into osteoblasts. Um, and with demineralized products, this goes through a uh, uh, chondroblastic intermediary. Um, but with synthetic graft materials, whilst they do form bone in ectopic sites, it's not through a cartilaginous intermediary. Um, but osteoinductivity inductivity in general refers to bone forming in non-bony sites. So it's ectopic bone formation. And if we go back to the original um, person I paid homage to, Professor Uris, Demineralized bone matrix is not a new idea. Um, there has been lots of historical reports of the use of demineralized bone, but it was Professor Uris work that really started off the whole orthobiologics pathway where the BMP, um, the BMP, uh, BMP family of proteins, really that's where it all started. But again, you can see there's a long history of um, demineralized bone matrix and it being used clinically. But many of these things have potential limitations. The original work done by Professor Urist, he ground up bone, extracted it with acid, placed it into animals, and looked at bone formation and uh, in either intramuscular or subcutaneous sites. But one of the problems with small pieces of any graft material is handling. And this work has evolved uh, in terms of DBMs into demineralized bone fibers. Um, which is a product um, based on some work from some good friends of mine, Andy Carter and Theracell, where they create fibers out of demineralized bone. And this removes the need for any excipient or any carrier. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this talk. Um, but osteo, um, uh, I guess, uh, bone formation in ectopic sites, again, is old news from a scientific point of view, because there have been many biomaterials that have been shown to be osteoinductive but they don't form through the endochondral pathway or the BMP2 motivated pathway. And when we look at when is something osteoinductive from a, a demineralized allograft point of view, you place it into a nude animal and you see if new bone forms, and this is an assay that is done 
and it's the only way to determine if a material is inductive. Um, and so it's an animal assay, uh, it's an in vivo assay where you look at the histology. So this, this is an example of an Australian biotechnologies um, osteoinductivity data where a material is placed into a nude animal and in 28 days, new bone marrow is formed. There's new osteoid, there are active cells on the material. And here's an example of endochondral ossification happening with the reformation of the marrow space. So a bone oscule is formed and there's still some residual demineralized bone matrix there that's still participating in the overall healing. Now, inductive biomaterials, as I said, um, I would love to tell you more about this, but that's uh, beyond the scope of tonight's talk. But suffice it to say, there is an enormous amount of work out there that um, suggests that it's the structure and particularly the nanostructure of synthetic graft materials that can stimulate a um, immunogenic or immunological response through macrophage mediated polarization to support new bone formation through a pathway in, in that side of things. Uh, and I've studied this with my friends in the, the Netherlands, um, Joost de Bruin and his group across many different campaigns where uh, calcium phosphates have been placed intramuscular or into um, bony sites. And we looked at how bone forms when it's placed in intramuscular sites. And this is one of the papers that we published. And it's related to the sur surface topography and surface um, features of the synthetic graft materials. Now, osteoconductive materials um, refer typically to bone forms where bone is supposed to form. So if you have a conductive graft and you put it into a bony site, it supports new bone formation on this. Um, it often doesn't happen through an uh, endochondral ossification pathway. It's by creeping substitution and new bone forms directly on the material and kind of just walks across the material. And we have seen this, and there are a series of osteoconductive graft materials. Um, and this is a, a 1980s graft material. It's a tricalcium phosphate. This is a more modern calcium phosphate that has a different topography on the surface. Uh, and this is a, a, a collagen-based sponge with a, a calcium phosphate component on the surface. Again, osteoconductive materials. And here's a, a recent osteoinductive material that we tested in a spinal fusion. Uh, and again, you can look at the, you can see the unique topography of these synthetic materials. Just remember that topography is very important, not only to cells, but also important to growth factors. It's important to what ultimately drives um, a lot of in vivo responses. And it, it may look smooth to you, but it may look rough to the body and it may look super rough to cells or lots of opportunities for cells and proteins to attach. And we've tested these type of materials in posterior lateral fusions in rabbits uh, and looking at the, the in vivo response based on histology and what cell types are there and what proteins are expressed. Now, we have to go back to autograft and really kind of continue our, our discussion <clears throat> thinking about autograft and how can we um, consider other options. And I've highlighted some high level definitions and now we can get into a little bit more of the meat. Now, obviously with autograft, there's many different sources for autograft, but it often depends on where your surgical procedure is. So, you know, if you're operating, operating you know, in the, in the craniofacial area, you're, you may not want to go to the iliac wing to harvest autograft. Uh, and conversely, if you're down in the foot, you may not want to go to the iliac wing. So you, could, you may go to the tibia, you may, you may go to the olecranon, you may go to different areas, depending on where your surgery is. So harvesting technique, a relative to your primary surgery site, this brings to questions and brings to mind, well, what's the type of bone available? What's the quantity? What's the quality? How much do I need for it? And then you also have to consider clinically, you know, do you, are you fusing the site? Is there hardware there? Is it a defect? Does it need mechanical support? Does it need structural support? So um, everyone would be probably very happy with high quality cancellous autograft. And that is a great gold standard. And it provides uh, a bony lattice and it, it has the potential for osteogenic cells. Whether or not all the cells make it after you harvest it, that's another question. But there are drawbacks of autograft and, and many of you will be aware of pain at the donor site and potential complications related to hematoma, fracture, increased OR time, limited supply, potential quality issues. This is um, from surgery I did today with my team 
we were doing spinal fusion in a large animal model in sheep, a two level inner body. And this is the iliac wing of the sheep and where we harvest cancellous bone off the um, iliac wing of the animal. We morselize it and we place it into inner body cages and we do lateral inner bodies. And then we uh, flip it over and do posterior lateral pedicle screw fixation to stabilize the site. Um, the autographed component of this surgery alone takes about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and it has post-operative morbidity associated in terms of pain and the potential of infection. So all the drawbacks of autographs, um, I'm 100% on board with that because when I didn't have to harvest autograph for the last case, um, the surgery was about 30 minutes shorter um, and there was no donor site. There, there was no additional surgical site. So there are potential um, uh, benefits of not having to go and harvest autograph, but it's a fantastic graft material. Now, autograft is also not free. Um, it does take time and that uh, costs money in terms of theater time. And it has reported, again, this is all well reported in the literature. There are potential um, complications and there is also potential long-term problems for patients. And this kind of lets us transition into the concept of allografts. And allografts have been around again for many, many, many years and they're used routinely all around the world. Um, and they're very popular in Europe and the United States and through Australian biotechnologies and the groundbreaking work um, that they have brought forward uh, and that I've been um, able to participate through the years. It, there's a whole suite of allograft based products for surgical use. Um, and it's important to reflect that the, the tissues that are provided um, are governed by the TGA uh, and through all the appropriate ways of uh, donor networks and donation of tissue. And it is a gift. It's the gift of life. And again, this is something that if you need more information about this, you can contact Australian Biotechnologies. I'm sure they'll be happy to tell you. Um, and they're actually quite proud of the donor tissue network and uh, in conjunction with the different governments in terms of the ability to bring this type of uh, tissue to uh, patients in Australia. Um, and one of the products that, uh, that I've been familiar with through the years is an Allovance based product. It's, it's effectively, <coughs> it's uh, allograft bone that has been processed in a way using carbon dioxide in a supercritical fluid state, which I just wanna give you guys a little bit uh, of insight into what this is and why does it look so perfectly clean and why this is a very interesting graft material. Um, we have to go back to what is sterilization and sterilization is obviously related to the safety and uh, infection risk. And these graphs all have an SAL of 10 to the minus six. Uh, and that is medical device manu uh, manufacturing level. So again, the high st sterility assurance. Um, and you can gamma irradiate the materials or you can e-beam them. Um, and these have potential uh, negatives to biological graph materials because they can affect the proteins, they can reduce the mechanical properties, um, they can be potentially expensive, and they have to be uh, conducted at uh, facilities that are specifically designed for that. Uh, and we have a limitation often in smaller countries to be able to do those kind of things. And this brings us to supercritical fluid. Supercritical fluid, um, to make it very simple, is really a cleaning technique. Uh, and because when a material is in its supercritical fluid state at its critical point, it has the properties of both a gas and a liquid. And so based on this, it has um, high surface tension and it has great diffusion and it acts both as a gas and a liquid. And what it does is it basically cleans the bone of all the uh, ensuing proteins that are around and all the blood and everything. And it ends up stripping bone back to its naked matrix, which I'll show you in a second. And what happens with a supercritical uh, carbon dioxide is that it goes through this different phase and then it becomes in, into its supercritical phase when it's both a gas and a liquid. Um, and supercritical fluid is actually very common. Um, I don't drink decaffeinated coffee, but that's a way to get caffeine out of coffee beans is with supercritical fluid. It is an extraction procedure. It is a cleaning procedure uh, and it is a way to um, basically delipidate, de defat bone. But one of the interesting things about supercritical fluid is it actually sterilizes. An offshoot of it is it's sterilizable. It sterilizes things. And um, there's an interesting UNSW um, relationship with supercritical fluid through Professor Langer, who is a professor in MIT. One of UNSW's professor 
uh, professors was doing a postdoc with him, Neil Foster, and uh, they patented the supercritical fluid technique for sterilization. Um, and SCO2 um, inactivates uh, all these different bacteria and viruses. Um, and we recently used um, supercritical fluid carbon dioxide to repurpose um, personal PPE in terms of masks. So basically re-sterilizing masks without destroying the properties. Because as you'll see in a second, um, CO2 um, is, uh, it's an excellent solvent, it's non-toxic, it's inexpensive. Um, we have these G uh, rigs in our lab uh, and it's easy to do. And you can also terminally sterilize things and it's a great technique. I'll show you how we make supercritical fluid treated bone in a, in a laboratory setting. This is very similar to the way it's made in the clinical point of view from a, uh, a technique. You can take cancellous bone, uh, remove the cartilage. In this case, we were making rabbit bone. We remove the cartilage and we just have the distal femur. We grind it up in a bone mill and then we, sep we wash it. And this is what it looks like before it goes through the supercritical fluid rig. And we wrap it up and super CO2 can actually pass through this bag because it's a gas and a liquid, it's all that, and this is what it looks like when it comes out. And you can see how clean it is. And then we can sieve it to get different particle sizes. And then we can package it again and do another one and sterilize it. And it comes out sterile, but this is a double pack in a Tyvek bag. And this is what happens if you do human bone. And this is the Osbio process in terms of taking allograft and going through all the different processes to finally the final product in terms of the supercritical fluid. And then we look at the surface under the electron microscope, this is gamma irradiated bone, same batch. This is supercritical fluid treated bone, same batch. And at 5,000 times the magnification, you start to realize is that you've exposed, this is what bone really looks like without the organic debris that's present during processing. We've tested it mechanically, we've tested it biologically. I'll just show you a couple of the quick papers. This is from Nick Russell, one of my postdocs. Um, and or one of my PhD students. And we tested bone in different uh, loading profiles, bending or torsion. This is the bending study. And we looked at it compared to gamma irradiated bone. Uh, and we looked at it in torsion. And you can see as soon as you start gamma irradiating bone, you compromise the mechanical properties where supercritical fluid had no effect on the mechanical properties. So it maintains mechanical properties where other sterilization techniques can reduce them. And then we looked at it from a fatigue point of view. And it's even more dramatic, <clears throat> excuse me, when you start dynamically loading bone and um, in terms of fatigue point of view, and you can see there was no effect on fatigue properties in the supercritical fluid or in the, um, in the SCF group. But as soon as you gamma irradiate bone, even at a low gamma, the fatigue properties go down dramatically. This is important for more structural base graphs as well as um, non-structural, but uh, if you need mechanical properties, a gamma irradiated and has a dramatic reduction. And we looked at it in vivo in preclinical models, uh, as well as in many, many patients. This is a distal femur defect that I drilled into a rabbit. And then I filled it up with um, rabbit allograft that was supercritical fluid treated. And you can see at six weeks, this defect is well healed. And if we look at it under um, the microscope, we can see this is the residual supercritical fluid treated bone because it's acellular because we removed everything with the treat, uh, cleaning process, but this has supported new marrow formation, osteoblasts on the surface, um, and again, new bone formation in conjunction with the SCF treated bone. Uh, and so this is a very nice repair, even at a six week time point. And again, this is just another example, another, uh, another site, that's where the defect was. And you can see this is the residual graft material and new bone growing and marrow spaces forming, and that's new bone marrow. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to getting, I guess, getting close to time where we can have some questions or at least, um, uh, you guys can get on with your lives. This is a processed allograft where we can take allograft bone and put it through professor Uris technique of demineralization, where we can make demineralized bone matrix, but that requires a carrier. So there are some limitations there from a surgical perspective. It also dilutes the product in terms of this is something like this would be 30% of DBM and 70% uh, of a carrier. And I'm just using those as kind of just, you know, ballpark. But then you can process it into fibers. And you can process it into fibers by de demineralizing the bone first and making fibers. 
or uh, cutting the bone into fibers and then demineralizing it. So there's a variety of ways to do it. Uh, and here's Elevance fibers in terms of uh, how much material you get. There's no carrier, right? You don't get the carrier down here. Carriers are great for surgical handling, but I think if you've ever used this product, the surgical handling is amazing. Uh, and you can also take these type of products and form other different products. This is a boat that you can use in a posterior lateral fusion. And this is actually a new product that won the best new tech at the North American Spine Society meeting last week um, by Theracell and, and Brad Pat and Andy Carter's team where fibers are formed into anchors that you can use for screw augmentation. So that's actually quite exciting and we've evaluated this as well. Um, why are fibers better than demineralized bone? Well, when you look at the literature, you can see that fibers provide both an osteoconductive and osteoinductive component. Um, and so you can see that when you compare fibers to um, particulate, you actually have a conductive scaffold as well as the inductive component because of the geometry. And so fibers, um, in my opinion, are, you know, they're the top shelf um, demineralized um, or processed allograph. One is because the, the in vivo results are so great, but two is that the science behind it is there to support it. I mean, we've looked at these, <clears throat> we've looked at these materials under these um, electron microscope. This is a single demineralized bone fiber. And when we get to, this is a 8,000 times magnification. And again, we can see the architecture of the collagenous scaffold of bone. So we've removed the mineral and then we've cut it into fibers and look at the elegant architecture. So this is the architecture of bone when you cut it into fibers uh, and the BMPs and the inductive proteins are associated with this collagenous matrix. And then they are, are liberated in vivo and uh, are able to elicit their um, differentiative and proliferative um, in vivo effect, mitogenic differentiating, um, chemotactic and, and so on. And we've put these this uh, demineralized bone fibers into spinal fusion models in rabbits. This is just a screening model that we did where we mixed it 50-50 with autograft or 100%. It's demineralized, so you don't see it. It has extremely low calcium levels. And at 12 weeks, this is a, a, a normal plain films, and this is a Faxatron high-resolution radiograph with fibers alone. It's fused the spine when it was used as an, so it's used as a substitute uh, it fused the spine when it was used as an extender or an enhancer. It fused the spine, and here's just another case where we flopped um, the we just flip flopped it. So we've done this many, many times. Um, and this is a case in humans where fibers are used in conjunction with um, the uh, corticocancellus allograft, the Elevance product um, from Professor Mobs, uh, one of my good friends, and who works at UNSW and Prince of Wales. And this is an ALIF spinal fusion. Uh, this is a three month time point, and you can see you already start, you have the starting of a robust fusion even at three months. So biology is being supported by the osteoinductive components as well as the conductive nature of these graft materials. Um, one of the myths that I also want just to throw out to people, this is a paper from one of my former PhD students, um, Frank Vizeshi, and he reported recently with his colleagues, um, Scott Bowden and Jeff Wang to high, um, very, very um, high profile and intelligent spine surgeons. They looked at what's the effect of cells in cellular allografts. And what this, what this paper very elegantly demonstrates is that it, the cellular components um, really had no additional benefit. And it was the demineralized bone matrix component that was actually the reason behind the, the formation. And this is a nude animal model. And they did a, a variety of different cellular based um, allografts. Um, and the ones that have demineralized bone in them, um, they potentially form, uh, they, they perform well. And if they don't have DBM, they don't perform well. And the cells really didn't do much. <clears throat> when you looked at um, the viable versus non-viable um, uh, cellular component, there was no difference in the manual palpation fusion rate. Whereas if you have fibers, demineralized bone fibers, it was 100% fused. And even if you devitalize the cells, it was still 100% fused. So uh, viable versus non-viable, there was no effect. And um, there's also histology in that that I don't have time to show you. And the last thing I just wanna show 
is it's not just bone that supercritical fluid can be used for. Um, we recently reported it in supercritical fluid uh, for tendons, um, where you can sterilize or clean tendons uh, and it doesn't adversely affect the mechanical properties and it has very favorable biological uh, properties. And we've also done meniscus, so, and we've done skin. So there's a lot of opportunities and it's a great technology to work with. Um, and here's just some more results with respect to that. I hope it hasn't been too much information. Um, I have a tendency to give too much information, but I hope we can have an opportunity to not only have a few questions, but also meet in the future. And if you do have questions and you want to email me, I'm happy to uh, entertain that. And I'll stop here, Andrew. Is that a good time to stop? Yeah, thanks so much, Bill. That was uh, fantastic. Um, we'll wait for a couple of Q and A's. I know people, I'm sure a lot of couple of people have got some questions for you. If they don't, they'll obviously send it via your email. Can you uh, let everyone know what your email address is? It's um, just w.walsh at unsw.edu.au. Perfect. So, so yeah, they'll obviously probably try and reach out. Um, so yeah, a question I had for you, in terms of the um, low-dose gamma radiating, the costal cartilage product that we have, um, what's your feedback on that? Well, we're actually, as you know, Andrew, we're in the midst of doing a costal cartilage um, evaluation. We have looked at the costal cartilage from uh, a radiographic a micro CT perspective mm -hmm. and histological perspective, and that data is still... Um, we're still analyzing that data, but what I can tell you is that the costal cartilage um, reproducibility of the graphs, um, we have seen it across different lots. I mean, it, it, it does handle extremely well, um, yeah. and even just like the curling of it and its ability to shape it, so yeah. that is, that's a, it's a very exciting material, yeah. and then I would hope that that would be, a, that could be a source of, I don't know, I wouldn't say your season six, or I'm on, this is your six. Season six, yeah, this is six, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six, well, maybe <laughs> count, me, count me in for like maybe nine or 10. Fantastic. You know? But I can talk about that. But uh, you know what, the, uh, the, the supercritical fluid technique it lends itself really, really well to bone. Um, yes. I'm not saying that gamma radiation is a bad thing to use. Um, yeah. And it is a time-honored time sterilization technique. Gotcha. Um, we have just found that, um, that SCO2 uh, is novel for the bone side of things. Yeah. Extremely novel. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, anyone else got any questions? Please feel free to send them via the Q&A tab or the chat function at the bottom of your screens. Um, a quick question for you from one of our attendees. Frozen versus freeze-dried. Okay, so in vivo, frozen versus freeze-dried, no difference in the in vivo performance. Um, I know that um, surgically at the time of implantation, if it's lyophilized or freeze dried, um, you do have to rehydrate it. Um, so there is that component uh, to consider. Um, the, the handling, very, very similar. Um, I think if I hydrated um, allografts that had previously been freeze dried, um, I would challenge anyone to tell me that which one was freeze dried or which was frozen. It's a convenience sake to have it froze, uh, freeze dried. Um, yes. It's a shelf life consideration. Um, I mean, I think the way uh, the graphs are uh, available in the operating theater where they're on consignment and frozen in freezers, it's fantastic. Um, no difference in vivo um, in terms of everything that we've done. Um, and I haven't seen anyone to, uh, or any clinical data to show that frozen versus freeze dried is variable. Um, the data that we've generated shows that it in vivo responds the same way. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I mean, I think the only other thing, Andrew, is that if it's lyophilized um, and, you know, maybe the hydration with other biological fluids might be different, but again, that's beyond the scope of, of what we've examined so far. Yeah. Have you done any um, sort of PRP, PDGRF uh, stuff with frozen and, and freeze-dried? I haven't done anything with frozen versus freeze-dried. But I've done, I mean, I, I did lots of work when um, PRP was first coming out. I mean, again, PRP comes from the work from Marx. Yeah. He was a, um, he was a, he, I don't know if he was craniofacial, but he was a, a Duarte and Marx. They were, it was in the oral Max Fax area where yeah. PRP kind of was born. But PRP also was born from the equine world as well. 
So uh, that's, there's a lot of um, animal-based veterinary world that have used many, many of these technologies before it's been used in humans. Um, but you know, the PRP is also, it's a funny beast, how you spin it um, and are the platelets, have they degranulated? Um, yeah. But we have seen, um, one of the nice things about um, Allograft is the opportunity for it to absorb proteins, mm -hmm. um, endogenous proteins, either bone marrow aspirate, um, but, uh, you know, and I know people have used it with other, uh, other growth factors, but then that's beyond the scope of this yeah. discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, quick other question. Um, uh, when using mixtures of granules and fibers, do you find any particular mixture percentage ratio works better than others? 50, 50, 80, 20, 70, 30 with regards to fibers and granules? Um, that's a good question. And I guess it all depends on like, what's your, um, What's your, what are you asking it for? If you're asking it for handling, uh, and I mean, I think the ratios that people are currently using um, that the products are provided, we did evaluate handling and different levels of handling. Mm -hmm. um, and they have been optimized in terms of a handling point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I like having a, a high inductive component yeah. and a mineralized component there. That's my personal bias. Mm -hmm. I like both of them. I like it because I like to have a, um, a mineralized component there to load bear and have the granules be able to pack on themselves mm -hmm. and also be able to see where it is on a radiograph. Um, yeah. I think 50-50 has worked very well in my hands. Um, yeah. And I mean, I've seen it use 50-50 in theater in many cases um, and it does handle well biologically. Um, you know, they, they both work, um, whether or not 80-20 or 20-80, it may be different uh, in potentially in different clinical scenarios, yeah. um, especially for, um, I don't know, migration. But one of the things that's great about the, um, the fibers is that they just capture all the granules. Yeah. You know? It just captures everything together. Yeah, so absolutely. really, it actually, it actually, um, it makes delivering the material quite nice. Yeah. Um, mixing antibiotics uh, with DBF in MaxFax procedures, um, what are your again, thoughts on, common, on yeah. contamination environment we work in? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the max fax environment um, represents, um, for me, an exciting area to hopefully explore with some of your surgeons that uh, interact with you. Um, yeah. You know, the release kinetics, we have not done any studies on the release kinetics of antibiotics on demineralized bone. Mm -hmm. um, that would be very simple to do. Um, and that would be very important to understand. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, calcium phosphates, bone included, absorb proteins very readily, um, mm -hmm. but they may elute them differently. Um, DBF and antibiotic release, um, uh, just, you know, my gut feeling is, is that we should test it before because mm -hmm. it may not, it, it'll may elute, <coughs> it'll elute everything at one time. Um, yeah. Much like calcium sulfates, if you mix calcium sulfates with antibiotics, we've published a number of papers it releases the antibiotics in the first six to 12 hours. And you, you still may have calcium sulfate there, but yeah. there are no antibiotics being eluded. Gotcha. So. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, let me have a look here. Yeah, we've got, I'll answer that. I'll answer that. I'll answer that. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think Ooh. I just make one, one um, yeah. Richard, Richard, thank you, Richard, for that. I mean, I think, um, the, the environment makes a big difference. And so whilst the majority of my work has been in the spine and the ortho side of things, you know, the craniofacial ENT areas, they represent different potential challenges and, and different potential opportunities for not only for research, but for materials to provide a clinical benefit. Um, and I think one of the nice things about, um, at least in Australia, we can all communicate and, um, you know, it's a, it's a great area of research and um, there could be some very exciting studies that would be very clinically beneficial in the future. And, um, you know, I'm in the lab every day. <laughs> so, yeah. so you know where to find me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you once again. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge and your experience and sharing with just, everybody tonight. I really yeah. appreciate it. I hope everyone enjoyed it. It was just meant to be a nice, uh, simple little yeah. chat on a Thursday. Absolutely. Look, it's look, it's really nice to share, you know, the knowledge with everybody, you know, knowledge sharing is always is always great. 
Um, but obviously, a lot of people in the MaxVac space are new to allograft, although obviously we've got a lot of surgeons using the allograft space, but it is still quite a new concept. It's not like the US, it's not like Europe that have been using it and you know are now using it majority instead of xenografts and, and grafts like that. So at the yeah, end of the bear day, in mind, bear in mind in the ortho and the spine space, it's been around for many, many, many years. And I'm sure that the surgeons have, you know, they've heard about it. Um, and you know what? I mean, I guess this is, I guess this is a, a take home message. If it works in spine fusion, it works anywhere else in yeah. trauma. That, that I'm, I mean, in preclinical world, if it fuses the spine, it'll definitely heal a defect. Yeah. If something heals a defect, it may not fuse the spine. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. but anyway, all right. If anyone wants to get in contact with me, I'd be happy to have a chit chat. And uh, Andrew, thanks again. Thank and, you. Uh, I hope everyone has a great day tomorrow. And uh, I think we're looking forward to the end of lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thank you once again, Bill. Really appreciate no worries, it. Mate. Look after yourself. Take care. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye.